Great, thank you. Uh, so glad to be here. Amazing panels. And uh, as Piero just said, what I'm going to talk about emerged out of crypto anarchy. And maybe it has the potential to transform the very nature of society. So I thought I'd take you through some of the things that were going on with, it's now called the blockchain, which is a new sort of social technology that uh, sort of Bitcoin was the first one, but uh, you'll see that a lot is happening in that area. So let's go way back to the origins of humanity. At least the, our, our ancestors uh, arose in Africa about uh, 200,000 uh, years ago. There were 27 other species of humans who all unfortunately went extinct, whereas we spread around the world and uh, inhabited every continent. How did we do it? Well, it's thought that we created a few new technologies that enabled us to cooperate at a new level that no other organism has done. The two key ones uh, were language, which enabled us to gossip about other people, so that made people be more pro-social, and moral emotions, things like uh, love and uh, guilt and shame, which also tended to create groups that could work together very effectively. And we mostly travel around in groups of 150, something called Dunbar's number. And our minds and our, our whole structure, our orientation to the world is really organized around groups of 150. You could keep track of 150 people, remember all your interactions with them, uh, you know, really know who's going out with who and who's doing what to what, and that's sort of what we're designed for. And we lived that way for a long, long time, uh, until about 10,000 years ago, when uh, we discovered agriculture, and we started using fire in new ways, and we started aggregating. Uh, agriculture allowed us to have food in more concentrated units. We didn't have to go, go uh, hunting and gathering. And we started building the very first cities. And the early cities were maybe groups of 10,000. Unfortunately, 10,000 is beyond our capacity to keep track of. You can't really know what's going on with 10,000 people. And so that opened up opportunities for people to behave in very antisocial ways. And so we needed some new technologies in order to get groups of this size to work together. And the four biggies were uh, money, contracts, government, and laws. So these were technologies that enabled people who didn't know each other intimately and maybe didn't trust one another to still work together. So for instance, money, which is sort of uh, one of the key ones, very interesting abstraction, allows you to, uh, you know, do trade uh, with uh, across chains of, uh, uh, of interaction where you don't necessarily know the people on the other end. And also to get IOUs, you do something for somebody today, and a month from now, you've got your IOU, basically with an early form of money, and uh, they will then do something for you. And so it enabled a whole new level of cooperation which has led to much of the development of the world uh, in recent times. Uh, the early forms of money were sometimes a little bit awkward. Here's an amusing one called Yapis Rye Stones, where were these 8,000 pound stones. Initially, they would roll to whoever was supposed to get this piece of money. Uh, that got to be kind of awkward, so then they just started sort of leaving them in place, but writing little notes about whose stone was whose. Uh, as time went on, money sort of took on more practical forms, so, you know, cows were an early form of money, and then shells, uh, and eventually we got coinage, and now paper, and it was important for money not to be easily counterfeitable, because, because it represents value, if you can make a copy of it, you can sort of get some value for yourself, and so that's the property of, of this money, but, you know, the big forms of money are kind of awkward, you don't really want to carry them around, and so as digital technologies really started going, Lots of people started thinking about, could we make digital money? Well, the key, it, first key insight into doing digital money came in 1976 uh, by these three gentlemen uh, uh, who were around and uh, you can uh, uh, talk to, who invented public key cryptography, which enabled people who don't know one another and don't trust one another to still communicate with one another securely and to sign digital documents so that you can be sure that it came from a particular person. So this is an amazing thing. Much of the internet, lots and lots of modern technologies rely on public key uh, infrastructure. Very, very powerful. Lots of people thought maybe this is the key to making uh, digital money. The problem is it, it allows you to sort of reliably say, I transfer value from me to you. It does not prevent me from giving that same value from me to you and also to you. So double spending is the problem 
with just using public key uh, cryptography. So somewhere you need to keep track of the fact that I've given some value to you so that when I try and give it to him, he knows that it's already been given away. And so in the 1980s, people tried to make digital money with centralized sort of bank-like entities that would keep track and have a big ledger keeping track of who gave what money to who so that you could avoid double spending. Never really caught on. In 2008, this amazing, mysterious paper came out from this person whose pseudonym was Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows who it is. Nobody, he has not come forward. Uh, and it, it was the basis for what is now known as Bitcoin. Uh, it it uh, started as just a little small thing. Uh, it currently has a, a market cap, if you add up all the Bitcoins around the world, of $18 billion. And it's being used in every country on the, on the planet for all sorts of different activities. And Satoshi came up with a very unique and interesting way of solving the double spending problem. Uh, he has a ledger, like a ledger in a bank might, might be, except instead of having it be centralized, where now you have to trust the bank, you have to trust the government of the country that that bank sits in, that they won't shut it down someday, uh, Satoshi's ledger was distributed. It was a decentralized ledger that uh, lived in all sorts of countries all around the world. And uh, these various copies of the ledger are kept uh, in synchrony with one another and are kept uh, in high integrity by these entities called Bitcoin miners. Uh, the Bitcoin miners work to make sure that transactions are added to the ledger in blocks. Hence, the ledger is sometimes called a blockchain because you have a chain of these blocks. Uh, in Bitcoin, it's about every 10 minutes a new block gets added to it. <clears throat> and the Bitcoin miners do this. Why do they do it? Well, every time the Bitcoin miner adds a block, they get paid in Bitcoin. So the miners have a stake in making sure that the whole system works. The problem is there are various attacks. When, when you're dealing with money, uh, hackers just love to sort of get into the system and try and find ways to secretly extract value through counterfeiting, through stealing money, through doing various things. Uh, the big hack for this kind of a system is what's called a Sybil attack, which is, let's say, the decision of what transactions should be added to the blockchain were done by voting. Let's say uh, all the participants or all the miners could vote. Well, then I could make a million copies of myself digitally, all with different names, so I, nobody else knows that it's all me, and have those million copies all vote for what I want to do and use it to steal some money or something like that. What Satoshi's brilliant idea was, was he makes the act of adding another block to the blockchain be something which costs you computationally. And so he requires the miners to solve these little computational puzzles, and all the miners are competing with all the other miners to add the next block. And, the one that's, and they, they do that by trying to solve these puzzles. The puzzles get harder and harder and harder as more and more miners try and compete, so that on average it takes about 10 minutes for somebody to solve it, and uh, then they get the payment from adding the block uh, onto the blockchain. And so this was the solution, and it has worked remarkably well. Uh, it's grown, and uh, as Piero was saying, it kind of emerged out of the crypto anarchy ideas. Notice that there's no central governance here. There's no government that can shut it down. Uh, the original paper was freely available. It's on the web. The software is freely available on the web. In fact, you can take that software and make your own coin. And in fact, lots and lots of people have. There are thousands of so-called altcoins, some of them worth quite a bit of money, none as much as Bitcoin. So it's a very strange and remarkable thing that really pushes the limits of what is the notion of money, what is the notion of value, how do people uh, coordinate and integrate their work. So in terms of transmuting the economic system, Bitcoin is a, is a very remarkable piece of technology. But <clears throat> More recently, in 2015, uh, a variant of Bitcoin uh, called Ethereum was uh, issued, and it now has about a $4 billion value. And it adds to the basic, it also has a blockchain, and it also has a currency called Ether, and it adds to the basic, Bitcoin is primarily used to transfer value from one person to another. So it acts very much like uh, paper money. Ethereum allows you to actually execute code on the blockchain in something called a smart contract. So me and somebody who I don't necessarily even know or trust, maybe on the other side of the world, can agree to a certain form of interaction called the smart contract, put it on the blockchain, and we can both be sure that it's going to execute. 
Sometimes the Ethereum blockchain is, uh, Ethereum is called a blockchain with a built-in programming language. Sometimes it's called the computer for the world because these programs, these smart contracts, are executing on these blockchains, copies of which are scattered around the entire world. So what can we do with this? Well, the first thing to realize is most businesses, corporations, are really just a set of contracts. Uh, it's a contract with uh, the business and its employees, with the business and its investors, with the customers of that business, and many of those contracts can be implemented on the blockchain. And so one of the ideas that lots of people are exploring is something called a DAO, D-A-O, for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. These are organizations which live on, these, on the blockchain, live up, up sort of in the cloud, and don't necessarily have any people involved. Further extension of that is what is a society? A society is also a set of contracts between the politicians who make the decisions for that society, voters who you know, kick, kick the politicians out or uh, bring them in, and potentially you could represent all of those contracts on the blockchain and create a decentralized autonomous society. So the first step of that is voting. Uh, in this past election, there are all sorts of voices questioning whether our voting system uh, really has integrity. Can we really believe the results? Are the right people voting? Is somebody voting more than once? Is somebody's vote not being counted? Are the votes being added up in the proper way? And today, you have to sort of trust the people who are running the voting uh, centers. Uh, there are cryptographic techniques which now uh, can be implemented on the blockchain in which each person can guarantee that their vote has been recorded correctly. Uh, they can check that the votes have been added up correctly and nobody else can check and see what your vote is. So there are a number of groups uh, creating these systems. Uh, here's one that uh, was just uh, talked of, uh, published a couple of, couple of days ago, blockchain verified voting. And so that's an example of a technology which can move us beyond where we are with a kind of antiquated, crazy voting system with a patchwork of things that don't uh, necessarily work very well to something which could be very unified and instill much greater confidence in the truth of the outcomes. Another issue that we've been hearing tons about is fake news. Um, all these stories coming out that uh, some people say are, are true, some say are fake, were a bunch from supposedly Macedonian teenagers who were injecting fake news into uh, during the election here last year. Um, how do we solve this problem? Lots and lots of groups are thinking about it. Uh, it's very subtle. This goes sort of to the core of what is the notion of true truth? How do we, as a society, come to consensus on what is uh, going on uh, in our reality? One approach to solving the fake news problem is to sort of crowdsource it. So. Uh, there are a number of groups who are trying to allow people to vote on what things they think are true or not true, uh, and then aggregate that in a certain way. And there's an extension of that to something called prediction markets, where you can actually bet on what's true or not true, or to bet on future events coming true or not coming true. And if you are correct, if you agree with the consensus, you actually make money. And if you are incorrect, you lose money. Here are two examples called Augur and Gnosis, which are building uh, prediction markets on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, reputation plays a role in some of this as well, that uh, if somebody, you know, on eBay, a big problem is somebody saying that they're going to sell a certain product, but then they don't actually deliver, or they send you a sack of bricks or something like that. And so you develop a reputation, and most people want to buy from people with reputation. So reputation has value. And so somebody who has consistently been honest about what is true or not true uh, can develop a reputation which has value that they don't want to lose. And so there are a number of systems for tracking and helping people maintain reputations on the blockchain. Uh, there's an amazing documentary. Uh, the BBC documentary maker Adam Curtis has done a number of very powerful documentaries about the current state of our world. A couple of months ago, he came out with this documentary called Hypernormalization, uh, in which he argues that many countries around the world have a political system or governments which are intentionally creating confusion as to what the reality is, who stands on what side and what's, hap what's happening. It's sort of a politics of confusion, which then leaves the population sort of unable to counteract uh, actions that they're not happy with. And uh, so, Potentially, you have 
uh, very powerful governmental forces intentionally trying to deceive a population. How do you counteract that? Well, I believe we need technologies that allow us to get to a ground truth. Um, one very contentious area is interactions of uh, police forces with citizens, and often there's conflicting stories about what the truth of an interaction was, and a very successful uh, answer to that was uh, body cams. And so both the police forces and the people on the other side like body cams because it gives you sort of an objective uh, representation of what, what happened in interaction. I believe politicians should also wear body cams. And if a politician knows that everything they're doing is being recorded, maybe not released to the public immediately, maybe it's going to be released in the future, that that will tend to prevent uh, a lot of corruption and distortion of reality. Um, we think things are sort of uh, awkward right now. Some new technologies which are very rapidly emerging are going to make things much worse. Adobe has talked about a program called Boco, which with something like 20 minutes of recording of your speech, they can then synthesize you saying whatever they want. And that's a, probably going to be a product in the next few months or so. So that's going to make the integrity of recorded speech go into question. Uh, there's a program called uh, Digital Emily, which uh, synthesizes an extremely realistic character who it's very, very difficult to tell is not a real human. Uh, a, a variant of that is one which takes existing video and changes what an actor or a, a recorded person is saying, something called face-to-face, -face. and uh, there's a YouTube video of uh, changing Donald Trump to say whatever uh, this person wants in real time. And so all of those technologies, and they're only going to get better, deep learning uh, people are, are working on this kind of thing very rapidly, will make it so that just because you hear a recording, see an image, or see a video of something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. So how do we get down to objective truth in that situation? A number of cameras are including GPS, so that at least you know where and when a photo was taken, but those uh, encodings are potentially manipulable. Somebody could take the image and change uh, its geo geotag or geolocation. The blockchain provides some powerful opportunities for giving you better guarantees about when and where something happened. Uh, you can get a proof of time by taking a code from the top of the blockchain, combining that with an image or a video, and then storing a, a hash, a summary of that on the blockchain, and you know that the uh, image or video was tagged in that way sometime between uh, the, t the, the initial time when you got the hash and the time when you added it. So it sort of narrows down the time that something happened. People are trying to do similar things for location by using timing of pinging between different uh, sites. They can nail down where somebody was when an event occurred. So using those kind of technologies and a bunch of others that people are thinking about, we have the possibility of recreating the basis for, of our society on much more grounded truth uh, using verified audio images, video, uh, proofs of, of a location and time and space, potentially using reputation to determine what news is true. Uh, blockchains enable uncensorable speech that a government can't shut down just because they don't like it. Uh, we can have verified voting, politician accountability, and a bunch of new political and social structures are being thought about, something called liquid democracy, which allows you to delegate your vote to a person or organization that you like. Futarchy, which allows you to separate out what you want to happen from the best, best mechanism to make it happen. The backfeed economy. Backfeed is a, a very uh, amazing blockchain-based rethinking of the nature of the economy and society, which allows sort of um, open source uh, organizations of people that create things and if you don't like something you can just move and start your own each one has its own currency and its own reputation coin and the exchange rates between them govern what a society does or doesn't do and so tremendous creativity and potential to rethink our society in a way that solves many of today's problems Steve just melted my brain. Um, I'm scared. Okay, so uh, the next panel is on virtual and augmented realities.